Hawaii, coming to you from Pioneer Plaza at downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Hong Jiang, Associate Professor of Geography at UH Manoa. And today's discussion is on circumventing censorship in China. Joining me today is uh, Dr. Tianliang Zhang, Senior Analyst at New Tang Dynasty Television and also a columnist at the Epic Times newspaper. So Tianliang is uh, what I call a quintessential Chinese expert or China expert, knowledgeable about just all things about China and the Chinese. So in today's dis discussion, we'll look at uh, China's media and internet censorship, trying to understand the approaches the Chinese people have been taking to cope with and to circumvent the uh, censorship. And uh, Tian Liang would also share his insight on the implications of uh, China's uh, media censorship, internet censorship, and um, uh, the implications of uh, people's, people's approaches. Uh, to deal with uh, the censorship. So, um, Tian Liang, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from the well, East Coast. Thank you for um, okay, so um, start. Uh, so, our show today is focusing on uh, what people do to deal with the censorship, ways uh, they adopt to circumvent uh, the censorship. But let's start first with uh, a understanding of uh, how the censorship works. Um, I want to use this example that's recently in, in the news a lot. Um, so the Chinese government just finished its a national congress, which is a major meeting every spring. And afterwards, the, the Chinese pre premier comes up uh, out to meet with the media to have this uh, press conference. You know, uh, imagine at this media, uh, the premier was taking questions and everybody uh, in the media, uh, uh, in attendance, uh, journalists from all over the world uh, were very enthusiastic, raising their hands and asking questions. So that's the scene we see. How does censorship work in this kind of setting, in this kind of a media uh, conf uh, conference? So uh, the results was really unexpected because before the press conference, uh, I wrote an article I think like uh, questions on doing how will be raised because this is probably the most mysterious news to um, all the people who work in media and that will be a breaking news definitely a headline news for uh, all the major media around the world so um, I remember that in 2012 when Premier Wen Jiabao had uh, the press conference uh, journalist from Reuters raised a question on Wang Yijun and then uh, Premier Wen Jiabao uh, give uh, very candid uh, comments on the Wang Lijun case and also Bo Xilai. And then just a few days later, uh, Bo Xilai was removed from uh, his position in Chongqing. So this year I was expecting the same thing. Uh, like uh, I expect uh, all those journalists from major media can not only bravely but also openly to raise the question on Zhou Yongkang. Um, and then it's time for us to see the real truth and it's time for premier li keqiang to unveil you know the cover on zhou yongkang case uh to my surprise nobody raised that question so i was uh, very shocked and then i was thinking what was going wrong so are those journalists not sensitive enough to catch this point uh or there's because some other reasons and then um, another report says that every question was already defined and prepared uh, in as early as in January. So all the journalists uh, who will attend that press conference uh, have received the calls from um, those people who work in the Department of Propaganda. Although they call it the Department of Publicity, but it's actually the Department of uh, Propaganda. They call it the Bu. It means it's um, a department dedicated for, in my words, propaganda or brainwashing. So, and those journalists were asked, were asked uh, what question they will raise. And then they said, we certainly are very interested in Zhou Kang case. And then they were told that they cannot raise that question. So not only on Zhou Kang case, but also the questions on Xinjiang, on Tibet, and other sensitive questions are not allowed to raise. So therefore, every question is prepared. If those Western journalists do not follow the rule, and then their media may have uh, you know, problems like they cannot extend their visa or probably they even be removed from the mainland China. So, 
Um, and well, sorry I to interrupt. Uh, uh, the, uh, the media, the, the uh, Skype um, transmission is uh, kind of a little bit frozen. Um, uh, maybe as uh, as I talk, uh, you can work with the studio over here to fix that. And um, so uh, apparently in just your answer to this question about uh, the media censorship here, what's happening at this uh, premieres uh, press conference, uh, basically it was a show that was put up, uh, it took uh, over uh, a couple months to prepare, and it's a show that was fooling the whole of the world. It's it just amazing. Um, I do want you to, to uh, come to comment, uh, g explain to our viewers just a little bit about the intricacies of what's going on there. Um, the uh, viewers may not know a lot about the Chinese uh, political scene. Uh, tell us uh, the significance of the Zhou Kang case. Uh, who is he and uh, why is the Chinese government unwilling to say anything about his case? Well, Zhou Kang is uh, very mysterious. So he was once the, one of nice one of the nine most powerful men in China. Uh, so he was a member of a standing committee of Politburo and was in charge of uh, the social stability. So Zhou Kang was in the standing committee of Politburo since 2007. So ever since then, uh, we can see that uh, the Chinese government has um, put tremendous money to maintain stability, and which is the Zhou Yongkang way of handling the social issues. So in 2010, uh, the funding that Zhou Yongkang can get is even more than what Hu Jintao can get. So Hu Jintao was the head of military, but the money he gets every year is less than what Zhou Yongkang can get. So that's just one example to show how powerful Zhou Yongkang is. Well, on the other hand, although he is in the tip of the pyramid of the Chinese power system, he was uh, there was not many information on him. Um, and then I think I remember that one of the report, I think it was from Financial Times or some like a major media like that, uh, reported that Zhou Yongkang was one of the uh, top 10 black collar people. So they say they call them black collar because they said they dress the black suit and then uh, everything uh, of these people are hidden from uh, public view. You know, you don't know how much money they have. You don't know how much power he has. You don't know uh, uh, what's the rule of his his work. I mean, what he was thinking and his background. And you almost know nothing about him. And then, uh, because Zhou Yongkang was so uh, prominent, like in the standing committee of Politburo, and then his support to Bo Xilai, uh was also very evident to the public. And then after Bo Xilai stepped down, uh, people start to focus on Zhou Yongkang and we'll see what happened on him. And then uh, ever since the beginning of last year, uh, Zhou Yongkang's secretaries, Zhou Yongkang's um, co-workers before, and Zhou Yongkang's some other subordinates, officials, and all of them uh, are removed from the position, very high-ranking position in uh, Chinese government, one by one. And then people say, Okay, so this is like Xi Jinping is uh, launching a campaign to target Zhou Yongkang because you know people around him have been arrested, and then a lot of scandals on him uh, starting started to uh, spread very fast uh, on the internet, uh, including his family, his brother, his uh, sister, his son, you know, even his um, uh, nephew. This kind of thing starting to spread very fast uh, on the internet, and people all project that Zhou Yongkang is in big, big trouble. However, in the past uh, 20 some years, uh, none of the standing committee of Politburo have ever been uh, brought, brought to justice. However, uh, seems Zhou Yongkang is, uh, will be the first one in the past uh, 20 to 30 years. Uh, so apparently, uh, this is uh, one of the top leaders, um, and um, it would be a, um, a, a kind of a major change if he was uh, he will be able to br be uh, brought down but uh, apparently you know people don't really hear much about what's really happening so right, but, uh, almost ahead. everyone knows that he's in big trouble because um, uh, in the beginning of the uh, people's Congress uh, there was a uh, media conference and then one journalist from uh, South China morning I guess 
uh, raised this question on Zhou Yongkang. And surprisingly, uh, the, sp the, sp the spokesman did not deny that. The spokesman said, OK, everyone who is corrupted will be punished. And that's all what I can say. And you know what I mean. So if Zhou Yongkang is OK, definitely this spokesman will say, oh, this is a rumor. Do not listen to that. You know, you, have, you should have trust the government, things like that. But he didn't say anything to uh, negate the question. And uh, he's actually implies or uh, implied that Zhou Yongkang is in trouble. Um, what's also interesting, I want to bring back to this uh, whole issue of censorship, is that in this case, uh, supposedly the uh, Xi Jinping, the uh, head of the uh, uh, government there, wanted to take down Zhou Yongkang. Uh, but still, at this press conference, they didn't want people to ask any questions. And uh, from what I read, I read one of the uh, Chinese newspaper, and they were talking about uh, um, the uh, attitude of the Chinese government uh, to say, well, ask questions, uh, but uh, um, do not uh, prefer not to uh, have you ask any questions about politics. It's just amazing that a political party didn't want to take questions about politics. And uh, so can you, uh, I want to reel back to this bigger question uh, of uh, censorship in China. Clearly, media is censored. And uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about the extent to which the media is censored in China? So first of all, in China, people are not allowed to have um, uh, media not controlled by the government. So even if you want to run the media, you have to find some government organization to sponsor you. And then the government organization uh, you know, is totally controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and when a media that reports something the government does not like, the media can be shut down and also the management of the media can be put in jail. Just to use one example, in 2003, um, a newspaper uh, called Nanfang Du Shibao, uh, basically it's a newspaper um, headquarters headquarter in Guangzhou, Guangdong province, uh, reported SARS, you know, that was um, uh, covered up by the central media for quite a long time. And then that media revealed that truth. And then uh, soon after, um, the head of the media was put in jail. Of course, you know, the Communist Party will not say, because you report something I don't like, so that's why I put you in jail. They gave him some you know, fabricated uh, crime. They say this person uh, took a bribe, you know, he was corrupted, so that's why he was put in jail. So therefore, you know, this is uh, just uh, one example, but you know, this showcase uh, how serious, uh, how strict the, the control is. And then other media, you know, they can see this case and they know uh, they have to um, define a zone, a safe zone for them, you know, not to cross the line. And then, uh, interestingly, you know, the, the zone they define could be uh, very conservative, you know, to, to just to make it safe. Uh, and then uh, in China, they have, uh, Communist Party, they have a department called Department of Propaganda. And they rename it to be the Department of Publicity, but the original name was Department of Propaganda. So that department will issue uh, orders to all the media almost every day, and more than one item say this you cannot report, that you cannot report. So, and therefore Chinese media are totally controlled. And then uh, the Western media, if you want to survive in China, you also need to follow the Communist Party's rules. So that is why it is so surprising that, you know, during the media conference, um, Li Keqiang did not answer any sensitive questions, and no sensitive questions at all was raised. Um, so in recent uh, months, we've uh, heard news about uh, certain foreign reporters uh, refused visa to work in China. Um, and uh, so we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we are going to uh, kind of learn a little bit more about uh, uh, internet censorship and then get to talk about how people circumvent the censorship in China. Um, this is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hong Jiang. And we've been speaking about circumventing censorship in China. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. 
And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you think? I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy, we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Okay, it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday. 4 to 5 p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on... Aloha, I'm Maria Kashem of Think Tech Hawaii and I want to tell you about our Think Tech talk shows. If you didn't know it, Think Tech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. And we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on Think Tech. I'm Maria Kashem, and I'll see you there. you from Pioneer Plaza at downtown Honolulu. I'm Hong Jiang. This is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be speaking with Dr. Tianliang Zhang from New Tang Dynasty Television on circumventing censorship in China. So Tianliang, right before the break, we were talking about uh, how this a uh, huge um, co uh, media conference uh, 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 with uh, the Chinese premier was basically staged, which is just amazing how they can just uh, fool the whole world. Um, yeah. And uh, with all questions uh, pre-selected already, uh, nothing was alive uh, there. So um, let's um, try to understand just, just a little bit of uh, the internet censorship before we get to how people react to this kind of censorship. Yeah, I think uh, based on the media censorship, uh, I think uh, our audience should have some basic understanding on uh, the control of information that comes party. Uh, is doing. And then from this, and we can, of course, you know, the next step is how about the internet? Because the nature of the internet is freedom, right? Uh, people can exchange ideas freely, and you can see video, you can see uh, in the news. And therefore, you know, that's why Chinese government have invested a lot of money to uh, censor the internet. So according to statistics, uh, the top 10 websites around the world uh, four of them are totally blocked, like including Facebook, Google.com, Twitter, uh, like some other major media were also blocked, like CBS or BBC. So the Chinese government invested a lot of money to uh, establish they call the Great Firewall, but we call it Cyber Burning Wall, to prevent Chinese people to access information freely. And also inside China, you know, um, if you post something that the government does not like, uh, that post will be deleted immediately, and also the person who posted may be put in jail. Uh, a very famous story was uh, in Chongqing, when Bo Xilai was still the Communist Party secretary of Chongqing city, uh, one of the persons said um, something sarcastic to Bo Xilai, and that person was put in the labor camp immediately, I think for two years. So after Bo Xilai was removed from that position, you know, it was brought down, and then that person was released. So but this is just one example. So you can see, to speak inside China is very dangerous, uh, if you speak openly or freely, and then if you speak outside China, and Chinese government have some way to block people from seeing that. Um, what about uh, the, um, you know, we hear uh, some um, China observers are saying, well, China's becoming more open, although they don't have the Facebook, but they have something, uh, it's a Chinese equivalent of a Facebook, like a microblog. Um, so it, how uh, would you uh, respond to questions like that, uh, to uh, people who are saying, well, China is becoming more free, you do have these outlets that you can express? Well, like, uh, they can easily do an experiment. So if they post something positive on Falun Gong, uh, or tea bag, or like uh, uh, sensitive information like that, and see what's the uh, result or consequence. 
So, so in other words, uh, there, there are more outlets for people to express, but you have to express things that are approved by the government. And if you exactly. say something that they don't like, then you are going to be uh, your message is going to be pulled down, and uh, the um, people who put out those uh, posts could also be in danger of being arrested, right? Yeah. Um, so back in two thousand five, uh, it was reported that China probably have uh, thirty thousand uh, internet police who you know uh, monitoring the internet internet twenty four seven, and then they can delete any uh, information that government does not like. But back then, China probably only have uh, uh, 45 million of uh, people who have internet access. But now the number of the number has um, increased by 10 times. So probably now we have uh, 600 million people uh, who can access the internet. So therefore, you can imagine like how many internet police they need to uh, deploy uh, to censor the blog and also to delete the blog. And also, um, I think uh, in the past few years, uh, there's a new word developed by uh, the netizen, the Chinese netizen. They call it 50 cent party. So basically, Chinese government hired people who uh, try to you know, confuse people. If you say something, the government's bad, and they can say something. You know, the, the logic was very twisted, but to confuse you, and they will speak something positive on the government, and then try to make that voice stronger. So for every post that they, they do, uh, they, will get, they will get 50 cents. So people call them a 50 cents party. So this is also a very large group of people, you know, that are hired by the government to, to praise the government, you know, to say something positive, and then to mislead the people. So uh, they call it, this is the main rhythm of the uh, main theme. It's a strange concept there uh, to think uh, these people are on contract, uh, working for the government by posting positive images uh, or messages. And each message they'll, they'll uh, earn fifty cents, and uh, uh, clearly the um, the more people are uh, uh, having access to the internet in China, and the Chinese government also geared up its control. So um, uh, we want to address something that um, uh, is reflected in the title. What are the different ways that people get around and circumvent the censorship and still find ways to express themselves? So uh, first of all, people, they really want to know the truth when something happens. So uh, one way is like they use the shortwave video. Uh, sorry, uh, shortwave video because, you know, the shortwave is, uh, if you broadcast it here in America, it can still be received uh, back in China. So the Chinese people, some of them, they use the shortwave and video to listen to uh, some independent uh, information source like Radio Free Asia or Sound of Hope or Voice of America, so to get the news uh, that is very vital to them. Uh, well, and then, you know, this kind of radio is just a, a one directional, so people can only listen but they cannot express. So other people uh, use internet. So Chinese government, as I said, have invested a lot to uh, block the internet. Uh, in 2002, they have already invested $800 million to build a firewall, but at that time, the uh, Internet Gateway is only uh, 9 gigabytes per second. And now, the Internet Gateway speed is 1 terabyte per second. So it means like the bandwidth has increased by 100 times. And therefore, we can imagine Chinese government have invested more to filter the content. Um, and then, however, some of the uh, scientists or network uh, engineers, they develop some tools for the people inside China uh, to penetrate the blockage. So there was a word in China they call the fanqiang. So basically it means like they uh, they go over the wall and go to see the uh, the, the outside world. Uh, and then, um, so probably there are more than a million people in China now uh, Penetrate using the best software tools to penetrate the internet blockage every day uh, to to read the news. Um, so this will be that uh, people inside China can get these uh, uh, software software package on the internet so that they can um, do this anti-blocking. Um, right. So actually, not only people from China, but also people from uh, Myanmar, from uh, Iran. Uh, so uh, from Egypt, so a lot of countries who have this internet censorship, 
and people there they like to use this kind of software actually developed by some of my friends uh, to penetrate the blockage. I remember that in 2009, if I remember correctly, uh, there was like kind of revolution in Iran, and a lot of people uh, went out, went to street and strike um, against the kind of election, I guess. And then at that time, every picture, every video or audio that the the major media like CNN can get were transferred you know, with the help of this, um, the software uh, to penetrate the blockage. Because at that time, Iran, Iranian government also blocked the, the information and the people there, they used the, the software tools to penetrate uh, and then send out uh, videos through Twitter, you know, and then so that the whole world can hear their voice and know what's going on there. Well, that, that's wonderful. Your friends are the heroes. Basically, they're helping all people who are uh, lacking you know, in freedom. Uh, and yeah, they can... it, Go ahead. it is also, actually, I should say, it's also very risky for them because in 2006, one of my friends who was uh, uh, one of the, the main uh, key scientists who developed this penetration software, uh, was um, his house was, was invaded in Atlanta and then uh, two people who um, two people who look like a Korean people, but I am not quite sure where they were really from. Uh, now his door, and then when he answered the door, asking who they were, and they said, we came here to deliver the water you ordered. And then uh, my friend, uh, Peter Lee, opened the door, and he said, I didn't uh, order any water. And then a gun was pointing to his head, and then they forced him to open the door and beat him up, tape his mouth, and also, um, um, try to ransack his family. So they didn't take anything that is really valuable, like uh, cash or you know jewelry. Instead, they took all his hard drive uh, away. So so the purpose is very clear. You know, they are coming to try to find out how software you know uh, works and why the internet blockage was not working. Uh, so I should say this is also kind of risky, but you know. But people here still want to stand up, stand up, you know, for the freedom of information inside China. Wow! Sounded like uh, the Chinese government somehow reached out and uh, uh, tried to uh, stop him, uh, uh, silence him. Yes, um, exactly. And then ever since that, the U.S. Congress they passed a law. I think in two thousand that happened in two thousand six, in March two thousand six, I remember correctly. Uh, if I remember correctly, so and then uh, the same year in 2006, and they had a hearing in the Congress, and then uh, Congressman Frank Wolf and the Congressman uh, Dana Robacher uh, proposed a law that the uh, United States should stand up for internet freedom, and then they appropriate 15 million dollar, I think, every year for the internet uh, freedom. However, Chinese government is pushing very hard, you know, uh, on this law, and then. I'm not no. I don't. I don't quite know about the status quo. But for the first few years, the money was not allocated for the really effective penetration software developers. You know, the money was just withheld, was withheld in the State Department and did not allocate. I'm not quite sure where the money is. But you know, I have to say, uh, the United States Congress is very brave, um, but Chinese government is pushing hard, very uh, you know, uh, blatantly. Wow, so much is going on behind the scenes there uh, involving the uh, different governments and different people. We're going to uh, take another short break. And this is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. We've been talking with uh, Dr. Tianliang Zhang about circumventing censorship in China. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech energy and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. 
We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Hi, we're back. We're live coming to you from downtown Honolulu. This is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii, and we've been speaking with uh, Dr. Tianliang Zhang about circumventing censorship in China. Uh, apparently, the uh, Chinese uh, government has severely censored the uh, internet, the media, and uh, again, the Chinese people are creative. So, um, Tianliang, let's uh, address some of the ways uh, the Chinese people adopt to circumvent uh, the uh, censorship um, in China. Um, yeah, um, so the Chinese government, they want to have, um, you know, the total control of uh, Chinese people. This is like uh, in the book 1984, uh, they really want to know everything. So therefore, you know, they have various ways to censor or to monitor the Chinese people. Uh, one way is to um, the position of people by his cell phone. Uh, so, you know, nowadays uh, in every cell phone, they have uh, GPS almost, you know. And even if you're not, you, you don't have GPS, um, your cell phone is talking to the base station. So based on the signal received uh, in multiple base stations, you know, they can calculate your position. So therefore, I remember that in 2010, there was a, a news uh, uh, in the Beijing newspaper. They said, uh, uh, now um, the Chinese government can easily find out you know, where there is a mass gathering. Because when people uh, gather together, um, you know, their cell phones are together. So therefore, you know, uh, there's a live picture. Uh, the monitor center you know, can see uh, you know, where the, the density of cell phone, you know, in each area, and therefore they can know uh, where are the people uh, gathering together. So a lot of dissidents in China, when they have, um, uh, even when they have dinner together, or they just uh, have a very uh, small group of people uh, to discuss something, uh, the policeman will show up very quickly because, you know, uh, their cell phone, as long as their cell phone was turned on, uh, the government know where they are. And then, you know, all those dissidents, their cell phones definitely uh, monitored. So, you know, if two sensitive cell phones are together, the government will uh, intervene. So that's why a lot of dissidents, you know, they turn off their cell phone and take the battery out before they, uh, you know, meet each other. Uh, so this is one way, you know, using cell phone to monitor. And the other way is to use the second generation of ID card. So they put an intelligence chip card in the uh, the second generation ID card, and everyone is supposed to, you know, carry that because this is your ID. This is like uh, our driver's license in the United States, so everyone needs to have it. Uh, no matter you want to buy uh, a train ticket, or you want to buy, uh, you know, flight ticket, or even you want to buy uh, a knife, you need to show people your ID card. So therefore, you know, ID card is very very important. However. In the ID card, there's a chip, you know, that can emit, uh, transmit signals, and then that can be read remotely. So if you are, like, within 10 meters of a policeman, the policeman can immediately know uh, who you are, you know, your background information, and if you are a dissident, probably, you know, some alert will be sent to the policeman, so the policeman know he needs to pay special attention to you. So therefore, you know, um, they try to position people and then, you know, um, control people. Uh, the Chinese people, you know, they're very smart. So um, some of the people, they put the microwave, uh, the ID card. Uh, so they put the ID card in, in the microwave and microwave it for five seconds, and then you know the chip is first. So and then um, it, ca it cannot be read. Uh, but you can still show this ID card, you know, to to buy a flight ticket and so forth. So this is this was a very um, inventive, and this is very very smart. Um, so basically, you know, the goal of the Chinese government is to control people's mind. Um, so if you look at the approach they take, you know, you can feel, uh, they really feel like their power really is very, very insecure. So, you know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, China is powerful, China is strong, China is this, China's GDP is the second, you know, just the second to the United States and even, uh, a mile sooner than the Japan, uh, but you know, from the censorship, you know, the Chinese government is really, really not confident uh, to the power, to the ideology, and to the control of the society. 
um, it, it, it's interesting to see the uh, pervasiveness of censorship and monitoring in China, even like, uh, you know, the, the cell phone people are using every day. And uh, of course, you can turn it off and take the batteries out, but then it's really inconvenience. Uh, and then ID card that's required of everybody. That, that's amazing. Uh, I, I thought that solution is very creative of, well, fry your ID card, you know. The recipe is like just zap it five, five seconds. It's, it's, uh, um, it's defunct. And uh, the other thing that I um, sometimes read about, uh, you know, what Chinese people do is uh, the uh, keyword um, filter yeah. and how people evade that. Uh, there are some interesting kind of humorous uh, stories there. I'm sure you know tons of them. Uh, that's very interesting. So, you know, keyword can be changed uh, anytime. You know, I remember that in uh, 2012, I think, or 2000. 11. I cannot remember the exact uh, time. Right? And there was um, some news on Jiang Zemin, and these people say that, okay, Jiang Zemin passed away. So, and then a lot of people start to try to find out the truth, you know, whether he passed away or not. And then the keyword can be Jiang Zemin. And then some of the people, they use uh, Jiang Zemin's idea, they call three representatives. Uh, in China, it's called the Sanga Dai Biao. So to use that to uh, represent Jiang Zemin, they will say, OK, three representatives passed away. And then three representatives became a keyword, so alternative words. So if you post that, and then your post cannot be uh, posted, on, you know, cannot pass a censorship. And then some people, you know, uh, some people say Jiang Zemin, you know, uh, he really looked like a toad, you know, so, you know, people just don't like him. So people say he's like a toad. So they use toad as uh, to, to represent Jiang Zemin. And then the word toad was also uh, censored again. And then people just use his surname. His surname, surname happens to be river in China. And then suddenly, you, you know, you cannot search river in, in, in China's uh, uh, search engine. And so this river name became, uh, you know, a sensitive, sensitive word. So, you know, the sensitive words can change from time to time. Um, but, you know, the most sensitive words are on Falun Gong. Uh, I remember that in 2005, uh, the Berkman uh, Center for Society uh, in Harvard University released a report in 2005. It said that a website can be blocked uh, with different probabilities. So if this website has uh, pornography, so only 10% of the chance, you know, the website will be blocked by the mainland China government. So if the website has fallen wrong on that, so 90% of chance uh, it will be blocked. So you can see, like, you know, which uh, the government uh, attached the most importance to. Uh, and then, you know, but Chinese people still want to talk about it. So, and then they may uh, either post uh, pictures, you know, they can convert uh, text into pictures and post the pictures. And therefore, it can circumvent the machine censorship, you know, because machines uh, censor censoring by searching the keyword. And however, it cannot pass. You know, I said that the internet policeman or the 50 cents party. And then some of the people, they, they also have a very uh, inventive uh, approach because the traditionally Chinese characters are written from top to bottom and then from right to left. So in that case, when they post the, 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 po the, they post it in that way, so it can circumvent uh, the censorship. So that was very inventive uh, and also very, very interesting. Uh, that's, that's a new one that I, uh, I've heard. Um, so you basically change the word order uh, to have it go from top to down, to, from, left, uh, from right to left. But yeah. the censors are reading from left to right, from, uh, from top to bottom. So therefore, yeah. you, you already have avoided the uh, um, keyword exactly. filter. That's interesting. And people can actually understand it because if you say "toad" and and uh, you know not everybody would know it's related to Jiang Zemin, and exactly. amazing to hear that all the rivers disappeared in China yeah. <laughs> during the time I, that Jiang Zemin yeah, was supposed I, to be dead. Like the Zhou Yongkang we mentioned in the beginning of the show, so Zhou Yongkang was um, you know a, apparently a sensitive word. So if you mention Zhou Yongkang, it's uh, you know you cannot pass. So they use. Uh, a nickname for him, they call it Kang Shifu. Kang Shifu is actually a brand name of uh, instant noodle. So they use Kang Shifu to represent Zhou Yongkang. So that noodle brand uh, as the Zhou Yongkang. And then soon that uh, noodle brand became sensitive word. And then people started to use instant noodle 
to represent the uh, general count. So they talk about the uh, uh, something mean, which means the instant noodle, and sometimes they use a pao mean, means like the instant noodle in the hot water to represent during time. So, but everybody knows, you know, what you are referring to. Uh, so, so now uh, I, I suppose the uh, the noodle uh, company is disappeared from the website, from web search, and and uh, if yeah. it's in the West, uh, the company would sue the government. You know, this is uh, causing us major damage <laughs> in sales That's because people can't even search us. Exactly. So that was very interesting because, you know, um, Chongqing, you know, where Bo Xilai was from, uh, was also a sensitive word because people talk about uh, Bo Xilai. And then um, how can they circumvent Chongqing? So they use another um, replacement, Xi uh, Hongshi. Uh, Xi uh, means West because Chongqing is, uh, you know, to the west of China, in the west of China. And Hong means Red, which means uh, because uh, uh, Bruce Lai, you know, he said we need to read to read those red classics. Uh, you know, you know, the Chinese Communist Party they call themselves the Red Party, and they call the military the Red Military, and they call the um, uh, their regime is called the Red Regime. So therefore, the red color red is very special, has a special meaning in uh, uh, Chinese politics. So people use red to represent the, uh, what Bruce Lai was promoting. And people use West means where Bo Xilai was, um, was um, you know, located. And then they combine them. They call the Xi means West, Hong means Red, and City. So, but if you read it, it sounds like a tomato. And then people start to use tomato to represent uh, Bo Xilai. I know this kind of explanation sounds very weird for Westerners. You know, you, you, you're using some uh, you know, object or some fruit or some food to represent a person. But you know, Chinese people they have no choice. Otherwise, their voice cannot be heard. Um, creative ways, interesting ways to to, to circumvent uh, censorship on the internet in China. Um, of course, uh, it can be very confusing. Is it really the tomato, or is it the person who is a corrupt uh, Chinese official that, that, that who was removed uh, from position? So. We're going to take our last short break. This is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. And we've been talking about circumventing censorship in China. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone Program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Hi, we're back. This is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll be speaking with Dr. Tianliang Zhang about circumventing censorship in China. Of course, censorship is so widespread, and uh, uh, trying to live with censorship is a daily life for just every Chinese person. So uh, interesting stories about some of the uh, creative ways that Chinese people use to um, get around uh, to say something on the internet. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. Tianliang, I wanted uh, to ask you the large question. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is, uh, can you, uh, from your perspective, you've uh, um, done a lot, lot of research and have been uh, observing China from in, uh, as an insider, because uh, a lot of people observe China not really knowing what's going on because uh, of a lack of certain intimate, intimate knowledge which you have. What are some of the large implications of uh, censorship in China? And also, the uh, next question would be, where, what do you see the censorship is going in China? Is it going to get uh, let up, or what's going to happen? So censorship in China back in um, early ages are uh, quite simple, uh, because you know at that time people uh, cannot run any mass media. Uh, even if you have something to say, the only thing you can do is to uh, write um, on the wall, you know, in a large in large character, so that people can see it. But still, you know, uh, the scope is li very limited. Uh, and then, basically, uh, the media is uh, one directional, is always broadcast from the government to the people, and therefore the brainwashing was uh, very, very effective. However, uh, when internet was 
development start to boom in China, and then it poses a, a great question or threat to the communist regime because the brainwashing uh, is no longer effective anymore because people can get free information on the internet easily, and then not only uh, just some information, but also you know uh, audio, video, pictures, you know, and, and that is spread very very fast. So that poses a really a new challenge to the Communist Party. So at the beginning, I believe the Communist Party was not aware of that and didn't, didn't know what to do. But after they started to crack down Falun Gong in 1999, and then they, they found that, you know, uh, a lot of information was spread on the internet. So, and then they started to launch the Great Firewall Project. They, call it, they also call it the Golden Shield Project. Actually, the head of the project was Jiang Mianheng, the son of uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, the ex uh, head of uh, Communist Party secretary, and he was also the head of the country uh, from 1989 to 2002. So, uh, and then at that time, you know, uh, people can only post uh, some text, uh, but then um, YouTube appears, you know, and then uh, the information one person can provide to the internet is uh, multimedia, and then, you know, this is more challenging. And Counts Party used two ways. So one way is that they uh, block the, the website, like YouTube, so it's totally blocked from mainland China. And, and many other Google services uh, were also blocked, like Google Doc, so people, because Google Doc can allow people to share uh, very large files you know, in the cloud. So, and then, um, so they also try to develop some equivalent product in China, like the, they call Weibo or microblog to replace Facebook. However, a microblog is not so easy to, you know, to, to form a community and to share, you know, within the community. And also the microblog, because it's in mainland China and then Chinese Communist Party, they have full control of that and then they can delete the post that they don't like. So. But I think uh, as the development of technology, we, we know that the nature of the internet is blocked and is to share. And therefore, I believe like uh, no matter how much money comes party put in, and their censorship will definitely be doomed to fail. Um, so is it um, going to be doomed to fail from external forces, like uh, uh, people just getting these uh, anti-blocking software and just keep going cracking the internet? Oh, do you see any change within the, the party? Uh, from what I see, especially from this recent um, press conference of the Chinese premier, they seem to have geared up the censorship, not letting it uh, up uh, at all, let, not letting it down at all. Right. And the less, uh, we have to say in this way, so the less confident they, they are, uh, the less information they want to reveal, or the less information they want people to exchange or share. So from the level of uh, sensors, censoring, then you can feel like the government feel like uh, itself is really uh, at very high risk. Uh, to the, to this year, I think will be um, people will see a lot of uh, breaking news uh, in China because ever since 2012, uh, case, the Communist Party uh, was split. So it was not because Zhou Yongkang, you know, they are not fighting on whether Zhou Yongkang should be safe or not. They are fighting on what they can publicize, you know, to let people know what crimes Zhou Yongkang have committed. So, you know, that's the focus. So therefore, that's why you, you can see the spokesman um, before the uh, People's Congress uh, when the spokesman answered the question, you know, he did not negate that Zhou Yongkang was in big trouble. Uh, so if that's the case, why don't tell people Zhou Yongkang in trouble? Because they have not decided what crime they can reveal to the public. So that is what uh, the Chinese Communist Party, they also have different, you know, group, and they are fighting uh, each other on how to define that. And the Communist Party, you know, even inside they have uh, this big problem, you know, they are fighting each other, and not even to mention that people in China do not trust them, and then people uh, are also longing for freedom. So I believe um, no matter the forces from external world, from uh, Chinese people, or from inside Communist Party, uh, definitely all those forces will come together, and then the Communist Party is in, um, I think their, their regime is uh, very, very unstable now. So um, we look forward to see the day that that wall 
um, is taken down, that firewall uh, that blocks the freedom of the Chinese people. Thank you so much, Tian Liang, for joining us. And this is an Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. And we'll be speaking with Dr. Tian Liang Zhang about circumventing censorship in China. I want to thank Thanks, our yeah. viewers who uh, tuned, in, tuned in to this program and uh, thank the uh, production team at Think Tech Hawaii. I'll see you next Tuesday at Asia in Review. Thank you and goodbye.